Good morning. Hi, I'm Jason. Before we get into our mobile church gathering this morning, I wanted to let you know that we are, were not able to record in the high school this week, and we actually recorded parts of our gathering before the events at the Capitol building. And so in a moment, I'm going to transition to Graham doing the welcome, and we'll have time of music, uh, kids' message, and the teaching. Uh, but I actually recorded the teaching before the events at the Capitol building, so just wanted to say something briefly about that. First of all, for those of you who are followers of Jesus, wanted to address you first. So the events at the Capitol building, seeing people carrying uh, Christian flags, carrying flags that said Jesus saves, carrying uh, different faith statements on flags and posters, just wanted to remind us that this is not the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus isn't the way of violence. The way of Jesus isn't the way of racism. The way of Jesus isn't what we saw at the Capitol building. Just wanted to remind you of that. And I'm gonna go further and say, if you have aligned yourself with this, this way, if you have aligned yourself with a political party, uh, a political figure, if you've aligned yourself with conspiracy theories that have led to things like this, if you have made a claim that God has said that there should be a certain party or a certain person in office, I I'm calling upon you to repent, in particular, those of you in Boone. So if you are a Christian leader in Boone and you have aligned yourself with these ways, I'm calling on you to repent. If you are not a follower of Jesus and you have seen these things and you thought, you know, this is the last straw. People, uh, people demonstrating hate and carrying flags of hate and carrying flags and posters with these flags of hate that claim that this is the way of Christ. If you're not a follower of Jesus and you saw these things and you said, you know, that's exactly what, why I don't want to be a Christian. That's exactly why I'm done with church. Uh, I'm sorry that you had to see that. That is a horrible thing to see. It's wrong. It's hate-filled. It actually isn't the way of Christ, and I'm sorry. And on behalf of people that are actively attempting to be and walk in the way of Christ, we are sorry. What you saw is not a reflection of the teachings of Christ, of the life of Christ, of the death of Christ, of the resurrection of Christ that we believe in and we're sorry. And so as we transition into the welcome and then the music and in the kids message and in the teaching, uh, just realize that I actually recorded the teaching before I saw any of the events at the Capitol building. Uh, but again, if you are a follower of Christ, realize that this, uh, one of the Ten Commandments, to not use the Lord's name in vain or to carry the Lord's name in vain, what we saw uh, on Wednesday is the essence of taking the Lord's name in vain. To misuse the Lord's name. To, to think that, that God would be on a certain side that God would want there to be hate, that God would want there to be violence, that God would want there to be racism, is the essence of what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. I think it has much more to do with events like that and postures like that than just saying a, a swear word. And we need to call these things out and we need to have conversations with people about this where we make it clear that that is not the way of Messiah Jesus that we are attempting to follow. And again, if you're watching this and you are not a person of faith or in particular not a person that is a person of faith in Jesus, I'm sorry. What you saw is not the way of Jesus. So as we transition now, I thought it'd be good for us to just take a moment of prayer, a moment of silence, to take a deep breath and enter into our mobile church gathering together even though we're apart. So if you would, just, just take a breath. Believing that God is 
in the midst of all this, believing that God is with us, trusting in God's ways in our lives, centering ourselves God, we pray for our nation. We pray for our sisters and brothers in Christ. We pray for those that witness these things that are not followers of Christ. And we pray that you would bring about healing, restoration, reconciliation, and justice. And we repent of the times that we have been hateful. We repent of the times that we have been racist. We repent of the times that we have mis used and miscarried your name, carried your name in vain. And we are sorry, we repent. And we ask for healing in our minds, our hearts, our mouths, our actions. And as we enter into a time of worship together, even though we're physically apart, May the words of our, of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you. You alone are our Lord, our God, our rock, and our redeemer. And we pray in and through the name of Messiah Jesus. Amen. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our worship service this morning. My name is Graham. I'm one of the pastors here at The Heart, and I'm really glad that you're with us. We are going to be talking about another area of sacred overlap together today, the overlap of status quo and change. Jason will unpack that in a little bit here, but there's kind of an overall theme of renewal that Jason will get into more. And so with that in mind, I wanted to read a passage of scripture that speaks to this sense of renewal for us today as we start out together. So would you turn with me, if you have a Bible, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'll start at verse 7 if you want to follow along. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Let's pray together today. Father, what a gift it is that not only do you make a way for us to be in relationship with you, to enjoy connection with you and life with you, but you also continue to be at work in us to make us more and more into the image of your son, to make us more and more into the people that you created us to be. Even in the hardest of times, God, you are with us and you are molding us. God, would you help us today and throughout this week to keep our eyes fixed firmly on you, to keep our eyes fixed firmly on what is eternal, that we might come to a greater and greater understanding of who you are and of how you're at work in the world, and that we would be a part of that, God. And so we give this time to you. Would you be with us throughout our service today, and would we recognize your presence with us, I pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, kids and families of the heart. 
As you know, for our kids moment, we've been focusing on images from the Bible. We've used a lot from Jesus, and we had a special focus on images related to the building up of Christmas. The kids ministry team and I have been talking to you about all kinds of images. We've talked about a plank, salt, a gift, talents, a seed, light. We're really grateful for Mr. David, for Mrs. Gloria, and Mr. Thomas, as they've helped us uh, come to these images in the Bible and interact with God to, to give us something that we can picture, something that we can latch onto and, and understand this relationship with our invisible God. So I want to give you an image that comes from another part of Scripture, from before the time of Jesus. There were poets called psalmists, and they wrote about their relationship with God. And I really, really, really like this image from Psalm 42. So let me read it for you. So this is kind of a picture. It's more than just one image. It's a picture. And it gives us two things in relationship with one another. A stream and, and a deer. Okay, it's not quite a deer. This is actually from the land of the Bible. It's called an oryx. And scholars today think this is, if you've ever read through the King James Version, right? I mean, that thing slaps. The strength of a unicorn, if you've ever read that passage, they're probably referring to this particular creature. It's a desert antelope called an oryx. So I don't have the biblical version of a deer in ancient Israel as a toy, but we'll just use this for an example. So just imagine a deer or something like a deer craving water, wanting a stream, and they're wandering around in an arid place. You guys know what the word arid means? It's pretty dry, right? So just picture this image from scripture as this psalmist talks about his relationship with God, a deer panting for streams of water. Let me read from Psalm 42. Like the deer that yearns for running streams, so my soul is yearning for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for God, the God of my life. When can I enter and see the face of God? So kids, just like you have a, an appetite. There's a reason you get hungry. It's because your body needs nourishment or thirst, right? You, you wake up and, and you're like, ah, I, need a, I need a glass of water or, or orange juice. Or if you're an, an adult, you might like, parents, you know what I'm talking about. You're like, I need, I need the coffee. Speaking of coffee. All right, you guys know how hunger and thirst work, right? You take the time to identify, I have a, a thirst, I'm, I'm thirsty, I'm, I'm hungry. And then what do you do? Well, you take the time to meet the need. I've identified a need for caffeine, and I'm taking the time to meet that need. The same thing is happening for your soul. And that's what this image is all about that our soul actually has a thirst. And the only way to meet that thirst is to take your soul to the place where it can be filled, to God. All right, so the, the thing is, guys, we have to be in touch with our thirsts and the thirsts of our soul. So I want you to imagine your favorite drink in this cup, is it chocolate milk? Is it hot chocolate? Is it orange juice? Is it apple juice? Is it just milk? Or is it ice cold water? Or adults, if you wanna follow along, is it coffee? Whatever it is that your soul needs, it's not just coming for a drink to survive. Being with God, it's like the best thing. It's like the most, decadent, amazing, tasty thing 
you can do. And I know it's interesting comparing God to something you can drink, but that's the very point of this image from the Psalms. So you have this craving, right? And, and here, the, the psalmist is giving a voice and giving us a picture to a craving that maybe we don't always feel or see or understand where to go with it. But your soul longs, just like a deer in the middle of the desert looking for water, your soul longs to be with God. I want you to think of your own soul like a thirsty deer and God like a stream that never runs dry, that never disappoints. So would you identify your spiritual hunger, kids? Would you realize that you need to spend time with God? Just like drinking water, just like eating good food. So let this image soak in. It's not a bad pun. And let the psalmist who gives us this picture, let those words just play in your head over the course of this week. Your soul thirsts for God. Go to Him and you won't be disappointed. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your morning and week. Godspeed. Church, as we enter into worship this morning, I don't want us to do so thinking that this is a time for us to set aside the events of this week. We are invited to come into God's presence in the fullness of all that we are experiencing, in the fullness of all that we are burdened for, and to bring it before God in His transformative power. We invite that power into it all. We invite it to transform not just the situation, but transform us in it, both individually and collectively. So I want to begin our time of worship by leading us in a corporate prayer. And this was written for this week. You'll notice as I read through it, a lot of phrases that you might recognize from different um, places in scripture. Most of it I'll read, but as certain phrases come up on the screen, if you want to agree with me in this prayer and the things that I'm praying, then I invite you to read those aloud with me wherever you are. But before we begin, let's take a moment and let's set our intention, let's set the intention of our heart. So take a breath in and breathe out. And I want you to notice anywhere that maybe you're feeling tension in your body. Maybe you're just feeling general tension of the times we are in. Maybe you're feeling tension about this service and what I'm going to say or what Jason's going to say. And I want you to release that tension. I want you to unclench your jaw, maybe relax your shoulders. Maybe you could open your hands and just be willing to trust God's spirit to move you as he's going to move you this morning. Let's enter this time with an openness for God to lay all of our hearts bare. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Amen. Humble God, we come before you in all of this mess with repentant hearts. We recognize that our mindsets have strayed from the mindset of Christ, demonstrated for us when being in very nature God, 
you did not consider equality with God something to be used to your own advantage. Rather, you made yourself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. You humbled yourself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Forgive us, God. We confess that time and again we have put our trust and security and earthly power before our trust in your backwards kingdom, where the last shall be first and the first shall be last. We have allowed the promise of power to lead us astray from the way set before us, both in apparent ways as well as subtle ways. Forgive us, God. We confess that we have allowed our egos to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. We have rejected sober judgment about ourselves and of others. We have argued, we have grumbled, and we have hated those who bear your image. Forgive us, God. We confess the ways in which we ourselves have contributed to the hurt and brokenness we see in our world and the division of people, whether through our actions or our inactions. Forgive us, God. We repent, examine our hearts, give us strength to let go of the ideologies we have clung to and falsely attributed to you, and to admit when we are wrong, confident that you offer grace freely. Empower us, God. When you came to earth in your humility to reconcile us, you did so in ways no one expected. May we keep our hearts soft and attentive that we may recognize you in places we did not expect. Empower us, God. Realign our mindsets with that of Christ. Grant us the courage to take the harder path of love, acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly the way you set before us. Empower us, God. All glory, Honor and power belong to you and to your kingdom, good and loving God, bringer of shalom, king of kings. Amen. We want to seek you in our own ways. We'll fast and we'll sing. We'll give for our gain. You're telling us that it's not. You don't need another song, you don't want our empty praise if we stop loving on our own terms. God will heal our wounds. God will heal our wounds. If we
Your 
Hi, I'm Jason. Over the last few months, we have been focusing on this almond shape that I'm calling the way of the heart. And it's when two seemingly opposing themes overlap and create this almond shape. And it's actually one of the most sacred symbols in all of history, at least from a faith perspective. There are a lot of traditions that have used this almond symbol as a sacred symbol somewhat representing this theme when two seemingly opposing things overlap. And I think that we have an opportunity as a community to walk in this way, to walk in the way of the heart, which is being willing to enter into the space of the other. And so if you look at this, it's not just kind of meeting in the middle somewhere. It is one side being willing to enter into the space of the other side and both sides being willing to do that, a a bit of a death to self, right? To, To listen, to engage. You have to move towards the other, not just to convince, but to kind of give way a little bit and to enter into that other space. And over the last few months, we've talked about the overlap of flesh and spirit, heaven and earth, divinity and humanity, accountability and mercy, work and rest, withdrawal and engagement, faith and doubt, light and darkness, giving and receiving and there are so many more but today is going to be the last one of this extended focus but before we get into it I want to recommend maybe some more that you can have some discussions with people about uh, freedom and slavery big groups and small groups relationships and religion uh, different interpretations i don't know if this is two maybe you could draw a diagram of multiple but there are different interpretations of the understanding of baptism what it is what it accomplishes communion salvation triuneness triune oneness kind of the three in one and those are just some you know christian doctrinal things but the, but I, I encourage you to keep going with this in relationships in digital spiritual formation groups consider engaging in this way Uh, But we need to be able to have these discussions and find this sacred overlap. We need to walk in the way 
of the heart. And today's is status quo and change. Sit in that for a moment. Where, where are you at in that? Do you think that things need to stay the same or do you think they need to change? Do you think we should maintain something that has been? Or maybe go back to what has been? Or should we change? Should there be growth? Should there be progress? And um, yet yeah, you could say, well, a little bit of both, fine. But wh where are you in that? Maybe think, you know that feeling when you're not sure if you want to stay the same or if you want to change? Do you know that feeling? So if that's you and you know that feeling, I wanna ask you to give yourself grace. Find the sacred overlap. And if you can learn to extend grace to yourself, then also you can learn to extend grace to others and maybe even to the collective us. There are parts of us that want to stay the same and to even go back to how things were. And there are parts of us that want to keep going and to move forward. But we need to be able to create sacred space as the collective us where one, one person or one group of people who chant one phrase and another group of people who chant another phrase would be invited into actively listening and loving one another, listening to and loving one another. Or as a friend of mine said, even if we don't see eye to eye, we can walk hand in hand. I keep getting asked this question over and over. When are we gonna go back to normal? A, a friend of mine, a different friend recently said to me, there's no such thing as going back, only going forward. And I, I really like that, it stuck with me that I don't wanna go back to normal. I don't wanna go back to school shootings. I don't wanna go back to war and tribalism. I don't wanna go back, back to a polarized culture. I wanna be a part of seeing healing and reconciliation and restoration. But I know that there are things that need to be preserved and maintained. Good things. It's hard to talk about the future when you know that there are certain things that need to be maintained and preserved. Uh, one of my guilty pleasures, I, I like watching comedians in cars getting coffee. <laughs> uh, I, but I can't, my brain doesn't turn off, so I somehow, even though I want to turn it off and just watch, and, watch something fun, uh, from time to time there's just these awesome, amazing, wise sayings that are said there. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this several times, but Joel Hodgson was the, was the guest and he's the mystery science theater guy. And Jerry, well, some of you don't know what I'm talking about, but that's fine. Jerry Seinfeld says, why are we looking back all the time? And Joel says, because when you look back, you know what you're going to say. But when, but uh, you know what to say about the past, you don't know what to say about the future. And that's so good and that's so true. We know what to say when we're talking about the past. We don't know what to say when we're talking about the future, but yet we feel compelled to talk about what could be. And so what do we do here? And I actually think that us talking about this as a church family and saying that we are willing to be in this almond shape, this sacred overlap where we die to self and listen, we are willing to actively look at where can status quo and change overlap and there would be the sacred space but I want you to realize that we are in a polarized culture, which means if we are actively willing to do this, it might not always be something that people like. Which reminds me of another quote. It's a paraphrase, really, from uh, the, uh, one of the main characters, Cameron Howe, of, uh, it was an AMC show that's on Netflix now called Halt and Catch Fire. Josh Anderson is the one who recommended that I watch this. Not recommended for children. And Cameron Howe, the, one of the main characters, she says, a lot of people are going to want you to fail. But that's because you're the future. And there's nothing scarier than that. And I actually think if we, if we walk in the way of the heart, if, 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 if you walk in the way of the heart, if you enter into this sacred space, if you enter into this sacred overlap, refusing to participate in and perpetuate polarization, you will find that people want you to fail. But 
To quote Whitney, I believe the children are our future. <laughs> uh, right, greatest love, greatest love of all, Whitney Houston, okay. Also covered very magically in the movie Coming to America. But I think that this generation, and I don't necessarily, it's not really an age thing, but something's happening now in this generation that is choosing love. This generation is choosing the third way. This generation, this generation is choosing the way of the heart. Something's changing. Can you feel it? Can you feel that something's shifting? Can you feel that even though there are things that need to be maintained, something's happening and there's no going back. Can you feel it? I felt it for years, but in, in different ways for different reasons. I felt it in 1999 when I sat in a coffee shop with a 22 year old who told me that they were sick and tired of church, but they felt compelled to stay close to God 22 years ago. Uh, I felt it in 2001 when I visited Boone and I spoke to someone on King Street that told me that that there's a church on every corner, but no one that they know goes to any of them. I, I felt it over the last decade in particular here in Boone when I've sat with person after person after person who has told me that their faith has shifted, their theology has changed, their doctrine has crumbled and is being rebuilt. I feel it. Uh, I feel it when I see churches putting on shows instead of loving enemies. I feel it. Something foundational is changing in the church. Something has to change. Can, do you feel it? And so there's a book for, uh, written by Phyllis Tickles. She's the author of a book called The Great Emergence, How Christianity is Changing and Why. Phyllis Tickle, author of The Great Emergence, How Christianity is Changing and Why. And she, she quotes and discusses the right Reverend Mark Dreyer, an Anglican bishop, and so I'm quoting Phyllis Tickle now, the right Reverend Mark Dreyer, an Anglican bishop known for his wit as well as his wisdom, famously observes from time to time that the only way to understand what is currently happening to us as 21st century Christians in North America is to first understand that about every 500 years, the church feels compelled to hold a giant rummage sale. And he goes on to say, we are living in and through one of those 500 year sales. So the premise of, the, of, of her book is that every 500 years or so, the church changes majorly. A major shift happens. And the book goes on to mention that in order for us to understand this shift, we have to understand that only history can expose the patterns of the past in such a way as to help us identify the patterns and flow of our times so that we can occupy them more faithfully. So she suggests, she argues, that we are in the midst of one of those 500 years or so massive shifts in Christianity. Right, we have to know what happened in the past in order to move forward in the future. We have to know what about the past needs to be carried in with us into the future, and we have to know what about the past has no place in the future. That's the question, isn't it? There are things that need to be maintained. There are things that need to be preserved. Uh, there are things that need to be changed as well. And I'll start right here in the mountains of North Carolina. The mountains of North Carolina have a, a combination of history. There are things about the mountains of North Carolina that have to be preserved, have to be maintained. They're so good. Clean air, clean water, pure mountains, they need to be maintained, they need to be preserved, right? We have to, we have to. There's, there's such rich heritage here. There's amazing things have come from these mountains. There's rich, unique music, uh, literature, folklore, craftsmanship, agriculture, agriculture, a beautiful, simple way of life, it's so good to maintain these things, they're gifts to the world. So don't change, don't change, don't change. 
status quo, keep them the same. Don't mess up these mountains. Don't mess up the air, right? Don't, don't mess with our awesome bluegrass music. It's got to stay the same. However, there are things in this world that have progressed. There are things that have progressed in many parts of the country and in the world. And even though we live in this little mountain town in the mountains of North Carolina in the southeastern part of the United States, doesn't mean that we have to be held back by, by the bigotry, racism, sexism, ignorance, narrow-mindedness that has plagued this region for a very long time and quite frankly has harmed the faith of many. It has to change. So the mountains of North Carolina, don't change. Please don't change. And we have to change. So here are three suggestions that I have of ways that maybe we can find overlap. Some things can't change and some things have to change. And one is, and, and I'm sure that there are, there's such a longer list than this. This is just my three limited offerings here. I think it's time for more voices. We have to have more voices, more interwoven voices with various perspectives in order to not be polarized, in order to get out of our polarizing echo chambers. What's next for the church, in my opinion, is that it's we need more voices, not simply a group of people uh, sitting and listening to one person, but more voices, and especially voices that have been pushed to the side and ignored. I think it's your turn, it's your time, it's time for more voices, which really leads to, it's kind of very much connected here to, I think we need to glean from the overlooked past. And here's what I mean. There are people that have been saying things for a really long time. It's status quo to them but many of us haven't been listening. There are aspects from the past that have been overlooked, marginalized, people that weren't listened to or weren't listened to enough that should have been listened to. Desert mothers and fathers, women who uh, were mistreated or, and are mistreated when they actually were just trying desperately to bring about change in abusive male dominant societies, people of color within white colonizing cultures, we need to listen to people that have not been listened to enough. And that's where I think we can find the overlap of status quo and change. There have been people that have been pushed to the side and not listened to by enough people at least, but what they're saying is status quo to them. Constant voices saying similar messages over and over again, deep truths that need to be maintained, but not enough people have been listening and it's time to do more listening. Their voices from the past and present are the status quo from within their cultures at least. And they just might bring about the change that you and I desperately need. It's not new to them, it's status quo, it's just new to us. They were anchoring us, but we haven't been listening. I, I've, quoted, I've quoted from the stage beautiful quotes from people that that then i reveal that maybe that quote was from someone that has been overlooked and it's unbelievable to see the responses and hear the responses from people i have quoted uh, I, I remember quoting someone and someone thought it was absolutely beautiful and then they asked me who it was and i mentioned it was from a woman in syria in the fourth century and then they didn't like the quote anymore we have to stop being so silly and so narrow-minded we can grow it's time to listen it's time to listen to more voices and in particular to glean from those voices that have been overlooked either from the past or present. We need to listen to the ancients. We need to listen to the Celtic people. We need to listen to the Coptic Christians. We need to listen to more women. We need to listen to more people of color. We need to listen to people who have been oppressed and ignored that have been speaking beauty for a very long time. And the old ideas need to be remembered as a way of creating new ideas to listen to. There, there's a woman named Cynthia Bergalt, I think you pronounce it Bergalt, with the Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque, New Mexico. She shared an idea, I'm just paraphrasing, that what, might, what may seem like a revealing, like a revelation, something new, oftentimes is actually an unveiling. 
So there's a veil blocking, and then when it actually gets unveiled, you see it and you think it's new, but it's been there the whole time. It's actually kind of a common theme in Scripture where the Israelites were had veiled faces. They they were so stuck in their religion that this the Messiah that they were waiting for for so long finally arrived and they didn't see. Their faces were veiled. It's a, a theme. And the third suggestion that I have is that we need to be renewed. Here's what I mean. This image that uh, of, of wineskins, Jesus teaching about new wine being poured into old wineskins and the old wineskins can't handle it. You have to pour the wine into new wineskins. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for some newness. I'm ready for something new, realizing though that it comes from the same old source or eternal source. So this new thing isn't new at all. Whatever that would be new that we're looking for has always existed from the eternal one. So I think it's important to realize the context of a, of a wineskin. No one pours new wine into an old wineskin. You pour the new wine into a new wineskin. We need something new. But I don't, I don't necessarily think that it has to be thought of as brand new. Like I said, gleaning from the old. In the, in the ancient Near Eastern, this warm climate, they would ferment this grape juice. It would ferment quickly in these wineskins, which were probably goat skins. And the new wine had uh it would expand quickly in the gases and then there was this protein in apparently this protein in the goat skin in a new goat skin that allowed it to to move and be flexible so as the the grape juice got poured in it started to expand and, and ferment and the gases would build pressure and because the goat skin was flexible it could move it had that protein but then after it used up that protein with that expansion, it no longer had it, so it no longer was moldable, flexible anymore. So then it was an old wineskin, right? So then if you're an old wineskin, you've already been used, you've already expanded, you don't have any of that flexibility anymore, there's no more growth. Then if new grape juice is poured into you, and again, it starts to expand more, you don't, you don't have that to give anymore, you can't move anymore, so then and you can't hold it in, you can't handle it. And so, it, well, it might, well, you just need to throw it away and have a new one. But that's not necessarily in the culture what they did because new can mean new, but new can also mean made new, renewed, right? Psalm 51.10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We can ask God to be made new, renewed wineskins if we're cracking and we're not willing to expand like we used to be, that we don't just get rid of something old, and we start with a new one, we can be made new and renewed. It reminds me of my baseball days with my baseball glove. You get a, you get a new glove and you break it in and there's oil and, and uh, uh, you get the baseball and pound away. But then over time, if you don't keep oiling it, it gets kind of old and cracking and it, it eventually it just doesn't work anymore. And in, in this ancient Near Eastern culture with the making new wine and, and renewing the wine skin, they would take this goat skin and they'd submerge it in water uh, it makes me think of baptism. Submerge it in water for a while and then come out and then treat it with olive oil and repeat and repeat and repeat until they were soft and flexible again. There's so much there, but I think that this idea of baptism, which actually predates the time of Jesus of Nazareth, baptism was we're really across the world is this cultural thing where people are made new, but this symbol of being made clean. You're not necessarily a brand new person. You have been made new. You have been renewed. You have been cleaned, a death to self, and you start over, so to speak. And then the oil, the oil so much in scripture is symbolic of the spirit of God. And so in order for us to be able to expand more and to grow, we have to be made new. We're not just brand new. We are the same, and yet we are renewed. It reminds me of Matthew chapter 13, verse 52, one of my favorite sayings of Jesus of all time. He said, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven, so a teacher, one with authority, one with knowledge, teacher of the law, it would have been the Torah, first five books of the Bible, or possibly the, all of the Hebrew scriptures or Old Testament, every teacher of the law who's become a disciple. So a teacher becomes a student, a learner. A disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. 
Is that even possible? Have you ever experienced anything like that? You ever gone into an attic, your attic, and found something brand new? I, I still, I have this dream of one day buying a house, I go into the attic and I find a 1952 Mickey Mantle rookie card. It'd be new to me. Actually, it wouldn't be new, but it'd be new to me. And I think it's probably not gonna happen, but it, it, it's important, this visual, that if we actually would be willing to listen, we think we know, but if we're willing to listen, we think we have this, this, uh, this way that needs to be maintained and preserved, but if we're willing to listen and become disciples in the kingdom of heaven and actually actively listen, die to self, become a learner, it's like we go into this storehouse, this thing that's been there, and all of a sudden there's new treasures and old treasures. See, there's, it's not one or the other, it's both. And if we would be renewed, if we would be submerged in that water, treated with the oil, submerged in that water, treated with the oil, our flexibility would come back. And when juice is poured into us and starts to ferment and expands and is made into this wine, we can grow with it. But not because we got rid of the old, but because we renewed the old. So yes, I think there are things that we need to carry into the future and, our, and I think there are things that have absolutely no place in our future. And there are some things that need to be renewed in us in order to carry them into the future. We can go back to the basics, believing that God breathes newness into old things, including us. That the Holy Spirit works in and through the words of God that are alive, that are active, that God teaches us. And so my sisters and my brothers, let's be in the present moment, gleaning from the overlooked past, believing that there is something new waiting for us to discover. And may you believe these things about God, and may you also believe these things about yourself. And may the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you and turn his face towards you and shine his light on you and grant you with peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks again for joining us this morning. I just wanted to provide you with one quick reminder before we end our time together, and that's that we have our church family meeting tonight at 6 p.m. via Zoom. And so if you haven't reserved your spot already, I encourage you to do that by visiting the heart.us slash church family meeting. We're gonna be spending our time together talking about 2020 sharing our plans for 2021, and also then breaking out into smaller groups for prayer and reflection. And so if that's something that you feel like you wanna be a part of, if you feel like you are very much invested in the life of the heart, and you want to know kind of where we're going, where we've been, uh, any of those kinds of things, the church family meeting is probably a good place to start. So again, if you wanna visit the heart, us slash church family meeting and reserve your spot. We're going to be keeping that open till about 3 p.m. this afternoon. And so depending on when you're watching this video, hopefully you'll have plenty of time to do that and then make plans to join us 
at 6 p.m. for that Zoom meeting. And I know for me, I'm really looking forward to it and really all of the staff, we're looking forward to seeing your faces and to be able to share in that time together. And so uh, please join us if you can. And with that, I want to thank you again for joining us. Blessings to you wherever you might be. And until we see each other again, until we gather together again, stay safe and know that you are loved and that you are prayed for.